Well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Robert. I'm uh, working for Red Hat, and I'm working uh, together with the uh, Grafana Loki team on the uh, Loki operator. At Red Hat, I'm part of the OpenShift logging team, and there in the log storage. And we're currently working on migrating our existing customer base that uses Elasticsearch to Loki. And I'm here to talk a bit about we, um, what we learned from, from running Elasticsearch for a few years, how we put this into, uh, in effect, in Loki, and what we're doing to make these deploying your, your Loki setup easy on your own cluster um, for the customers um, using an operator. So first, let's start with a few facts. Um, I already said, so I'm working in the OpenShift logging team. OpenShift, this is the containerization product um, from Red Hat. It's based on Kubernetes. Um, it has a part that's called logging for Red Hat OpenShift. Um, it's split into two parts, the collection side and the storage side. And like I said, the storage side used to be based on Elasticsearch. And we are migrating that side to Loki now. And um, for um, one of the things that, that, that we do in, in OpenShift is we try to use operators um, to keep more complex software and workloads alive in your cluster. And so our product uh, logging for um, Red Hat OpenShift, it consists of two operators, one for the collection side and one for the storage side. And the storage one used to be the Elasticsearch operator, and it's now the Loki operator. So what has happened over the last years? Um, we've been working together with Grafana, the Loki team, on this since the early days of 2.1, which was around 2020. And so with the newly released Loki 3.0, this makes nine or 10 releases, depending on how, how, much, how you count. Um, the operator has been released uh, about one and a half, two years ago now, the first version, and we've already reached adoption with over a thousand clusters uh, over our customer base. And this number is only bound to, be, uh, to increase because there are still a lot of customers using Elasticsearch. Um, what we did for the operator is we focused on a single use case. Um, we're deploying Kubernetes to, uh, we're deploying Loki to Kubernetes, to OpenShift, and it's an in-cluster workload. It's only meant to, log, to, to do logging in the cluster and um, ship those logs somewhere or keep them in the cluster. Um, and internally, um, for Red Hat, we, we, as the log storage team, we support two products, logging that I've already mentioned, and the other one is network observability, who use Loki as a storage for their network traces as well. Okay, so why did we pick Loki? This was mentioned before. We're trying to democ de democratize op uh, observability, and Loki is the part that's de democratizing logging. Um, we've seen with Elasticsearch that it's very complex to run a log storage system at scale. Um, a lot of people have a lot of logs to store. Usually they're surprised how much it is. Um, but it needs to be as easy as possible to run your logging stack. And Loki looked like a good replacement for Elasticsearch because it does a few things different to Elasticsearch. Our main uh, thing there is the, that the indexing doesn't, uh, doesn't happen on the ingestion anymore, and you can just ship the logs and do the heavy processing just on the ones that you um, actually want to read. And so uh, Loki looked like a viable replacement for Elasticsearch, and the last years, I think, have shown that, it, that the choice was a good one to make. So, um, what did we do with the operator? Like I already said, running the, the log aggregation system, it's, a, it's not a simple task. Um, you have to uh, account for, for a lot of volume. Um, you have to run it, and then Loki itself 
It's also not, not that simple to run, to uh, configure. It has a lot of different options that um, are interlocking. And so what we did is we picked the one use case that was relevant for our, cu our customers. We focused on that one and um, pick, made decisions to make that use case simpler. We tried to reduce dependencies. So if you look at the configuration of Loki, you can see that you can use all sorts of databases to store the indexes and to store the actual log data. Um, and we've narrowed this down to a single choice. And we've also removed the dependency on other databases completely. So Loki is the only thing that's running in your cluster. Um, and I already mentioned this, the Loki configuration is very complex and long, so we simplified the configuration to provide just the options that we think are necessary and group these around uh, the customizations that we think are necessary. So let's talk about these different points. First, um, the, the use case. So what we did there is we picked um, similar to, uh, for example, what AWS does with their VM instances. We picked a few predefined sizes that we based on our customer sizes. So we called them extra small, small and medium. Um, we started with small and medium and then last year we also added a smaller one, the, the extra small, which used to be our development size, but we've made a few changes so that it's also production ready. And common to all of them is that they, um, you can pick the one you need based on the uh, amount of logs that you anticipate to ingest. And then also move between those sizes should you need it. But for, for short-term short spikes in, in your usage, either on the writing side or on the reading side, um, there's ho horizontal scaling possible um, for the, for the uh, components that Loki consists of. Um, and uh, the other thing that we did is we said, okay, we focus on the short-term retention. So I know that there are customers that want to um, keep logs mainly for auditing reasons for a very, very long time or need to do that. But this is not the use case that we want to solve with this logging system. It's the short term, I want to debug my workload on the cluster use case. Um, then the thing with the, with, the, um, with the dependencies. So like already mentioned, Loki used to support and still supports a lot of different backends for the indexes. So for example, Cassandra, Bigtable, Consul, and similarly, the same for data storage. And it also supports, um, because it, it consists of different uh, components, it also supports a lot uh, of different solutions for arriving at a distributed hash ring um, for the different components to do the same thing consistently. And you can use console and etcd for that, for example. But in the end, we decided to get rid of all that. And for the, data, for the data storage, we um, picked just the object storage. So this mean, means using Bolt DB Shipper or more recently the TSDB Shipper uh, to store the indexes and also getting rid of the external um, distributed hash ring by using the uh, so-called member list hash ring that's in integrated into Loki. So in the end, you just have um, the Loki components running and don't have to keep track of any external database anymore. Um, this leads to a lot of simplification while running the workload and also while um, debugging any outages and so. What you can see here, for example, is that this enables us to provide dashboards, ship them directly with the operator so that um, the customers and our support, they, they can look at this at the same data and um, uh, debug issues easy, more easily instead of having to look at 
at different um, database products to debug stuff. Um, and also, we can use our operator to uh, extract metrics out of the, um, of the, uh, out of the Loki deployment. And I mean, in the end, once we have the, the dashboards, the metrics, and provided our alerts, we can also provide playbooks um, that make common failures easy to debug. Okay. And similarly, um, for the configuration, um, as already mentioned, the Loki configuration is quite complex. If you look at the whole configuration file, you get more than a thousand knobs that you can turn that have um, re different results based on other configuration. And it's not, of course, not of all those thousand uh, configuration knobs that are relevant for each use case. So again, we pick the ones that we think are the relevant ones and we slim down the configuration to um, what we call Loki stack, which is a custom resource um, made available by the operator in the Kubernetes cluster. And in that uh, Loki stack configuration, um, you can now do, like, there's, a, there's a few configuration options, of course, that are required, like where Loki should put the objects um, into the object store. Um, but you can also customize um, different performance aspects like limits for the ingestion, rate limiting for the timeouts and limits for queries. And of course, you can configure retention. Like, like I said, we aim to keep the retention as short as possible, maybe with a maximum of 30 days. But this limit is not um, enforced by the operator. It's just a recommendation. You can still configure retention as you like, and also um, by stream or by tenant. Um, and one advantage of the, of the operator uh, paradigm that we're using is that because we only have a very short amount of, of um, configuration options that we provide, we can also upgrade the users to newer configurations options. So when, when we see um, that we have an issue with our current configuration, and this is something that's reported by support, for example, it, it's possible to, to change the, the configuration over all the deployments using a new version of the operator. And it also makes migrations easier. So for example, I mentioned TSDB shipper, um, this com also comes with a new schema version, and this is something that we can't do fully automatic because it's a relevant configuration for the user, but we can give hints to the user, for example, by, by emitting an alert that, oh, you're not using the latest schema version. With this version of the operator, you have access to a new one. We think it would be a good choice to update to that. And then the user can update the um, Loki stack configuration and the operator will do the rest and update the Loki components. Um, and the last thing is we're uh, running Loki by, by default in the fully distributed mode, but we are not using all components by default. Um, so um, we've gotten rid, for example, of the, uh, of the query st scheduler because in our use case, there's n not so much a risk of a no noisy neighbor, for example. So this is something that we probably don't need in our use case. Um, or the ruler is only um, uh, is only activated if the if the configuration requests it and not automatically. Um, and the the third thing is that we, of course because we want to integrate with uh, OpenShift as much as possible, um, and we have customized the Loki tenancy to match the tenancy that's also already provided by OpenShift. But um, in that way, the Loki operator is agnostic to the platform, so while there is a mode that's specifically tailored for OpenShift, um, there 
um, if you use it outside of OpenShift, you can customize this to any um, tenancy model that you need. Okay. Um, I mentioned as, uh, as the last thing that it's not just available in OpenShift, and that's something that I mean, uh, really. So, um, as mentioned here, lokioperator.dev 